Well, hello again. It is Paul Feuerstein, strangely locked in my room once more. And uh, what, a, what a pleasure I have to know so many people and have so many good friends in dentistry. And I'd like to introduce to you Chuck Cohen. Chuck, how are you this morning? I'm fine, thank you, Dr. Paul. Nice to see you again and love your haircut. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is it. This is, <laughs> it's getting worse and worse. I can't legend. see it. You're, you're I legendary. A, I had to put my bangs up. <laughs> so Chuck, let me just tell you who Chuck is for a second, then I'll tell you a couple of stories. But Chuck is the managing director of Benko Dental Corp Company. Uh, Benko has been around for how many years now? 90 years. Uh, my grandfather started the business in 1930. What was his name? Ben Cohen. Ah. The name Benko. That's right. That's I the see. I see. <laughs> so just to, just to clarify that. So, so Chuck and I are actually... Uh, high tech geeks and, and we run around to the dental shows where I've seen him in every other place, including Cologne, Germany, and uh, always looking, he says, what do you, what did you see? And I say, I don't know, what did you see? And we're trying to compare who has those things. And, and Benko company has been right in the forefront of all the technology in the CAD cam. They've early on, they put pieces of the puzzle together for us. So people didn't have to figure out what they needed to put together. And, and to this day, still, still right up there and you're doing a great job. And, and of course, a complete dental supply company. Um, so how's business right now, Chuck? <laughs> well, business is kind of lousy, I got to tell you. Um, I was saying to you before, it's as if every dentist in America went on vacation on a cruise the same week, two weeks, three weeks, it's going on a long time. So our business is down about 80% the last four weeks. And honestly, no one in our organization had ever envisioned a business plan for business being down 80%. So it's been tough. Well, we're down 100% in my practice. So. Yeah, I'm sure. It's so, tough. Emergency only dentistry is all we're, is all anybody's doing. That's pretty much it. So, so I guess I guess I should just jump in right away. And so, one of the problems that we're going to face coming back from a dentistry standpoint, and then I want to ask you about the industry and combination, is what is going on with this personal protective equipment? We can't get in Massachusetts where I am. We can't get anything because it's all going to the hospitals. Yeah, and supply chains are ridiculous. So, I, what, do you have any insight where, where this, what's going on here? Yeah, so I can share what we know today, and it is literally changing every day. And most, what most people are asking me about first is masks. The challenge that we're all having as an industry is that N95 masks are regulated by FEMA, by the federal government, and they are directing where the supply goes. So, even as masks are being made and the supply chain is ramping up. FEMA has not yet determined that dentistry gets an allocation of masks. So even a company like 3M, as fast as they can make them, FEMA has determined, and I don't think we can argue with it, we need frontline healthcare workers to get them first. They are getting frontline, those who supply frontline healthcare workers who are dealing on the front lines with, uh, with COVID-19, they're getting the N95 masks. So as soon as dentistry is allocated N95 masks, Benco, Shine, Patterson, and others will get N95 masks. Now, the other thing we hear about a lot are what's called KN95 masks. For those of you who are unfamiliar, KN95 masks are just a, K stands for masks that are made in China. So it's the Chinese version of the N95 masks. The challenge we have is almost at, at this point moment, every lead on KN95 masks that we have run down at Benco, and we've run down nearly 100 of them in the past four weeks, all of them have turned out to be some form of counterfeit. Wow. So there's a lot of masks out there that say they're KN95, but they don't have the proper documentation and they don't have the proper manufacturing to really prove that they are. Um, and they're not regulated in the same way. So we've decided in our organization to this moment that we're not going to get involved with KN95 masks unless we can verify them, verify totally that they are not counterfeit and that they work as intended. Well, so I'm, I'm, I'm depending on, on this to right. save my life. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Well, it starts with you're going to have to shave your beard at some point. I'm sorry. to. I don't want to be the, 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 the bearer of bad news, Dr. Paul. But basically, facial hair does not work with an N95 mask. So at, at this moment, our recommendation is, um, and it's the ADA's recommendation, is everyone should be using the highest level mask they can get. At this moment, in dentistry at least, for the most part, it's a level three mask. At Benco, we are blessed that we do have level three masks in stock and we are shipping them. We rationed our stock early and I believe there are others who are out of level three masks. So you should use the highest level of mask possible plus a face shield. And then as soon as N95 masks come in, we will start shipping them out to customers. We have put, the, put in an order for $10 million of N95 masks from 3M. And as soon as they are able to ramp up their supply, and they're able by FEMA, FEMA regulation, to supply them to dental, uh, dental suppliers, we will get our share and then we'll start shipping them out. 
So that's what we get asked about the most. Um, and so it's a little bit of a nip and tuck, but it is okay to use a level three mask and a face shield until such time as you get access to an N95 mask. And I think it's going to depend on procedures also. I mean, we're worried about aerosols from uh, hand no pieces, question. cavitrons and things like that. And, uh, you know, everybody's worried. And, and I think it, it, this has to be a, rational, a rationality with this whole thing. Um, yeah. so, so that's part of it. So let's jump a little bit. I want to talk a little bit. I'm, I've been very impressed with what Baco has been doing while we're stuck, stuck at home. You've been putting on webinars and seminars and, and just thank you so much for, for these. And people, people are saying, oh, it's free CE. That's not what it's about. This is real education. I mean, I learned everything about the, the, the loans that are available and all that sort of thing. So tell, tell me what you've been doing on that, that front. So as soon as dentistry shut down in mid-March, we got together with our practice solutions team and we, decided, we asked ourselves, what can we do to be of service to dentistry? And what we decided to do was put on a series of webinars. There's been no fewer than two, uh, sometimes four a week. They've yeah. all been free. They're all with experts in the area, K Kane Waters experts, people from Seattle Study Club, expert practitioners. One of my favorites is Tim Twig. Tim Twig yeah. is the foremost expert in small business um, human resources. And he's been terrific. He's done two or three of these programs already. Um, and our goal has been to keep everybody a little, little entertained and mostly well-informed about how to get back on their feet as soon as dentistry reopens. Now, I will tell you that we're trying to do the right thing, but honestly, we're also trying to do something that's good for us because if dentists don't get back up and working quickly, we're not gonna sell a lot of products. So that's it's true. a little bit self-serving, but it's very much also in the, in the community's best interest. So I don't, I don't think I'm so. very proud about that. <laughs> that. That really doesn't show, I don't think, and you've been pretty much non-commercial. You sort of sit in the background on these things. So um, one, one of my favorite interviews was we, I interviewed personally Dr. Gahani the president of the ADA last week. And that was a really good one. We had over a thousand people and you can find the recording of it, listen to it later. But I'll tell you, I was impressed with Dr. Gahani. I think we're all a little frustrated with the ADA. We'd like things to move faster, but as far as he's concerned, he's open, he's honest, he's a good guy. And I do think that I came away saying, here are a group of people who want to do the right thing in a tough situation. The, the, the ADA has published the, uh, a workbook and a worksheet mm -hmm. for, you know, for reopening. And there's been some very, very good things from a lot of people on, on, on how to, what do we do from, from this point on. Mm -hmm. So speaking of this point on, how are you going to strategize now? You see, you're, well, everything's in lockdown and things are going to be opening up slowly. The dentists yeah. actually don't have any money. You're going to have to extend some credit, by the way. Yep, as you probably know. Yep. And uh, so, so what, do you, what do you foresee from here to the end of the year, if, it, if such a vision is possible? Um, so what, a couple of things we see, number one is dentistry is going to get busy right away because there's a pent up demand. Sure. And then our, our fear is that dentistry, dentistry is going to start to tail down. Um, and then hopefully we'll pick up by the end of the year, the main variable. And this is the point I think we all have to understand is it's been over two decades since our patients have been nervous about safety, right? So you have the gray hair. I don't yet have the gray hair, but I have the experience to say that I remember what it was like in the late eighties, early nineties, when patients were very nervous to go to the dental office. I think there's a lot of dentists out there, and this is my coaching, is a lot of us have gotten a little sloppy on some of our safety issues, maybe some OSHA protocols, universal protocols. Certainly, we've been sloppy about addressing patient concerns head on. Um, we've got a, a world out there where people are afraid to go to a restaurant and a movie theater and a shopping mall, let alone a dental practice. And I think we fool ourselves if we don't understand that our patients are going to be nervous. Now, clearly, patients in pain need to go where they need to go to get out of pain. But beyond that, I think we need to be proactive with patients to make sure they understand, here's why dentistry is safe. Here's what we are doing in our practice to keep you safe. And here's why what we're doing to create a safety culture. So I think the key word between now and the end of the year is safety. Well, the patients have become much more educated. They know what uh, sterilization means now, infection control. They, they know these terms. They're going to come in and look like look all over the place. Yes, they will. So, so one of the things that we talked about a little bit before is that when, when I design my dental office and we, you build dental offices all over the country, you just build them. And, and we don't have regulations like hospitals do, do we? <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. One of the things that I foresee happening down the road, and again, not immediately, but as time goes on, is we'll probably have to live with a higher level of healthcare regulation in dentistry than we ever have before. I don't think we quite recognize it, but dentistry overall is not regulated very much on the state or local level. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons. There haven't been reasons to do it, but I do think going forward, dentistry, uh, dental offices are going to look more like traditional healthcare offices, not quite to the hospital level, but more like a physician's office. And I'll give you some examples. And the local health authorities are going to start regulating us to a higher degree. 
I'll give you one example that's very obvious that we don't really think much about, and that is um, you just don't see open operatory settings in other versions of healthcare. It just doesn't exist. Uh, we just hired a new VP of sales, a chief revenue officer over from McKesson. She said the biggest shock to her in moving from medical to dental was walking to dental offices and seeing open operatories. That's just not something we see. So going forward, we're going to see closed operatories, closed sterilization centers, a different version of a waiting room. We're going to have to rethink a lot of the basic uh, tenants of dental office design that we've become very accustomed to for the past couple decades. Well, even thinking of waiting rooms, if you think of banks, when you used to go to the bank, there was this big shield and a little tiny window, and then they said, took it all away. Exactly. It's all quite open. And have to put them all back down. <laughs> exactly. We're, we're going to go back to an environment where it's going to look more like a healthcare setting. And good, right, wrong, or indifferent, we have patients in society that are focused on safety and more on safety and less on comfort. And I do think that that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a change. We'll all get through it together, but it's going to be a significant alteration in what we've been yeah, doing. And even the term waiting room, obviously, right now is, is going to go away. Literally. Absolutely. So we'll have to rethink sure. everything. So, one more thing I just wanted to touch base with you on. Dental trade shows, what the heck's gonna happen now? Well, I think a lot of us would say that dental trade shows have been trending downward the past couple of years regardless. Uh, I don't think this helps at all. I was on the phone with uh, Roger Levin, a mutual friend of ours earlier today. And um, you know, he's very active in trade shows, does a lot of speaking engagements. I would foresee that there probably won't be any trade shows between now and the end of the year. And what happens in 2020 is a, ma 2021 is a matter of conjecture. I do think that we have too many small trade shows. I've thought that for years. If nothing else, I'd like to see us get to a situation where we end up with 10 big trade shows across the country and not 170 small shows with a few big ones. Um, so I think this is going to really uh, hopefully force a level of consolidation on the trade show circuit that we haven't seen before. That means I have less frequent, I'll have less frequent fire miles. That's no good. You know what? I'm sorry to say, I think all of us could use less frequent fire miles these days. I don't even know what a plane looks like anyway. I just I just saw I, something in the papers that they're changing coach. They're going to have seats sitting backwards and shield. I saw that. It's going to it's going to be a different experience. And I've got to tell you, I, I, I'm not saying I'm missing it now. I can't wait to get out of my house in general. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't think I'm missing getting on a plane every week or two. So that'll right. be definitely a change. Both me and you together. Mm -hmm. I do hope that we get to the IDS. I hope they do something with the absolutely. IDS. Absolutely. So. Yeah, absolutely. Great dental. There's always going to be a role for great dental meetings, New York, Chicago, the IDS. Um, I think we all have to rethink these smaller meetings that we're probably on the cusp of not being viable in general. So, well, well Chuck, I'm glad. I just wanted to grab you for a couple of minutes and just get some sense from you. I mean, we may get you back in a little bit later on to see okay. where we've gone. You know, after we, maybe when we get back to the work and see how things are going, check in with you again. Anytime. Uh, always a pleasure talking to you. And by the way, I have to always thank Chuck for something he did, something special that he did for me. Uh, when I first started working with Dentistry Today, my, they put my picture on the front cover of the magazine. And Chuck sent me a framed copy of my own front cover. I'll never forget it. It was just such a thank. Thank you so much for making me like that, Chuck. I, <laughs> I was proud to know a cover boy. So uh, I thought it was great. And, you know, I know you wouldn't get it framed yourself. And <laughs> I, I think that was, I was very impressed with the, with, uh, with the uh, recognition you've gotten within the profession, and it's only grown since then. So thank uh, you. And thank you, too, for what you've been doing. So thanks again, and we'll check in with you soon, and stay safe in Pennsylvania. Absolutely. In Massachusetts, and see you soon, I hope. Thank you, Paul. Absolutely. Hopefully soon. Thank you, Paul. All right. Talk to you.